Dear friends of the American Academy, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first lecture this semester. My name is Thomas Rommel. I'm the director of programs here, and it's my particular pleasure to welcome our speaker tonight, Douglas Rivers. The first row right here. Now, as you can tell from the turnout tonight, if you look around you, this is a full house. The presidential election campaign in the US and the upcoming elections in November are regarded globally with great interest. Perceptions of and attitudes to both of the candidates as well as the electorate differ wildly. The American Academy in Berlin is particularly interested in providing a framework in which to discuss this topic in the form of a transatlantic dialogue. We are therefore delighted that our speaker tonight is Professor Douglas Rivers, one of the world's leading experts on survey research, who will share with us some of his insights into current voter tendencies and preferences. Now, this morning, Douglas told me to, first of all, please be very brief, which I will, done in a minute, and not to believe anything that media people tell me and say about him. So I turned to the most reliable source of trustworthy information. <laughs> yes, that, that, of course, would be your Twitter profile. And here Douglas Rivers describes himself as, quote, an absent-minded professor, sometime entrepreneur, pollster, and econometrician, end of quote. He is, in fact, a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution. He's also a professor of political science at Stanford University, the chief scientist of YouGov, and now we are proud that he is an American Academy lecturer. Most important things always come last. <laughs> now, before coming to Stanford, Doug has taught at several other leading research institutions such as Harvard, Caltech, and UCLA. If you're interested, we've provided you with a little leaflet with all his honors and awards and his biopics, everything that you always wanted to know about Douglas Rivers and more. Besides this, he's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and as such has founded two successful technology companies. He was named Executive of the Year in 2000 and that, I can assure you, is no mean feat for a professor. And he received the Innovators Award by the American Association of Public Opinion Research in 2001. And because, really, being a professor and a CEO is probably not enough, in 2004, Douglas Rivers founded the global polling firm YouGov Polymetrics, which conducts online polls mainly about politics and public affairs. And he has been a member of the Board of Overseers of the National Election Studies. Did I mention he is a news consultant? Well, Douglas Rivers is a news consultant with CBS. And that's the only information that I unearthed. There's probably more where this came from. So tonight, Doug will talk about discontent in the American electorate. But frustration about politics is not particular to the United States alone. Yesterday's regional election here in Berlin is a perfect example of that very phenomenon. And that's, I promise, the only sentence on this from me here tonight. In the past years, all over Europe show the emergence of, um, of new, more extreme parties, especially to the right of the established political spectrum. Most commentators see this as a symptom of rising dissatisfaction among the voters. The, as it's called, in inverted commas, problem of declining trust, as the economist, the journal The Economist has it. In Germany, the word Wutbürger has even found its way into the lexicon by now. Now, a century ago, a popular song in England ran, I'm not going to sing it, but, and I always voted at my party's call, and I never thought of thinking for myself at all. This has changed, one would hope, because today people do think for themselves, and some are ple displeased, others are frustrated, and many are full of anger. Therefore, Douglas, we are very much looking forward to your talk with figures, tables, stats, and everything you could possibly hope for, entitled The Angry Voter, Discontent 
in the American electorate. Douglas, it's all yours. Shows a little bit of fear about what's going to happen can bring people out for a data talk. <laughs> Um, I've always wanted to start a talk with, uh, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all downhill from here. Um, so my topic tonight is uh, the angry voter in America, uh, that uh, people are visibly uh, mad uh, about politics, uh, and it seems to be making them do things that don't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, there's uh, a new best-selling book by J.D. Vance called um, Hillbilly Effigy. Uh, and what he writes about is a portrayal of uh, his relatives, uh, who are from Appalachia, now live in a uh, steel town in Ohio. Um, and these people have a belief that they've been betrayed by government. Uh, they have a sense of victimhood that somebody has done something wrong to them. Um, and uh, they're not... Uh, voting what would seem to be their economic interest. Um, uh, there's another book uh, recently published by Arlie Hochschild, who's a uh, sociologist at Berkeley, called uh, Strangers in Their Own Land. Um, and this is about a set of Tea Party supporters in Louisiana. Um, and uh, these people uh, are working class whites. Um, I think you'd call them lower middle class. Uh, they're not really poor. Uh, or even uh, overtly racist. Uh, but they're deeply disturbed uh, by government. Um, she makes an analogy, which uh, they ascended to, that's um, of people standing in line uh, who've worked hard to achieve the success that they've got, uh, and that someone breaks uh, in line ahead of them. Um, and the someone, uh, in this case, are minorities, uh, women, immigrants, uh, public employees, uh, and the person uh, leading them, uh, who, or at least who symbolize it, is Barack Obama. Um, and that's a bit of a story about this election. Uh, all of this rings true, uh, but the evidence that comes from these sources is necessarily anecdotal. Um, so what I'm going to do is bring you a lot of data, uh, and for what it lacks in literary color, I'll try to make up with, with brightly colored charts and graphs. <laughs> Okay. So uh, the first thing is there's a lot of anger out there. Uh, we asked, uh, these are data from YouGov's online polls, uh, which I do several times a week. Um, and so we asked people uh, about how often uh, do you get mad when uh, reading or listening to the news? And about a third of the people say they get mad every day. Uh, another third get mad. Um, uh, mad a few times a week. Um, as they told my uh, daughter when she was in elementary school, we've got an anger management problem here. <laughs> um, furthermore, uh, it seems to be making people uh, do crazy things. Um, so uh, we ask, uh, do you think we need a president who is willing to shake things up in Washington, even at the risk of making things worse? Um, this is basically, do you want to shoot yourself in the foot? Um, and what we find is that the Trump supporters uh, really don't think they have a whole lot to lose. They're willing to risk it. Uh, whereas Hillary Clinton, um, you may not love her, but she's not going to blow anything up. Um, uh, P.J. O'Rourke, uh, who's a libertarian conservative, said that uh, Hillary is awful, uh, but at least she's awful within normal parameters. <laughs> Um, in fact, though, uh, what we find is that there's anger at both ends of the ideological spectrum. Uh, about equal numbers of people who are very liberal and very conservative uh, get angry every day. Um, this anger measure I'm going to use repeatedly through the talk. Um, and um, the people who are more moderate or more moderate or liberal, but not very liberal, are the ones that seem calmer about this situation. Um, 
Yeah, if we uh, think about it, the, uh, the Trump phenomena and the Sanders phenomena have a lot in common. Uh, they were both heavily populated by white males. Uh, the Sanders vote, uh, one of the, uh, the best predictors of it were uh, you were white uh, or you were uh, male. Uh, the, uh, they were younger than the Trump voters. Um, uh, the candidates themselves had certain uh, similarities. Uh, they both had budget plans that didn't add up. Uh, in Trump's case, it was a wall uh, that was going to be magically paid for by Mexico, um, whereas in uh, Sanders' case, it was uh, free college for all. Um, and uh, they both uh, expressed certain paranoia about foreign trade. Um, so anger is not just a Republican phenomenon. Oops, I'm one behind here. Um, contrary to what you might expect, though, um, men are no more angry than women, on average. Um, there's not a lot of difference between whites and blacks in their level of uh, anger. Uh, Hispanics are less angry than either. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that's funny because I mean what Black Lives Matter is angry about is uh, is a serious thing. Uh, but we should be clear that there is anger on both the right and the left. Um, nor um, uh, nor is it the case that uh, anger is just a working class phenomena. If you uh, our best measure of of socioeconomic status in the U.S. is probably education. Um, and what we see here is that uh, people who are college graduates are actually slightly more angry than those with a high school degree or less, um, who are the topics of hillbilly elegy and so forth. Um, so um, the primary explanation for anger is that we've had a generation of essentially stagnant income for uh, the middle of America. Um, interesting thing here is uh, that higher income people, uh, I'm not sure I'd call 100,000 or more rich in modern day America, but certainly um, higher income are uh, more angry than lower income, uh, showing that you don't have to be objectively uh, harm to be uh, to feel that uh, you're hurting. Um, one explanation offered by Barack Obama in 2008 was that people are clinging to their Bibles and their religion. Uh, not a lot of difference between evangelicals and sinners in their degree of anger. Um, however, oops. Um, <laughs> People who pray a few times a week also get angry a few times a week. <laughs> I won't speculate about what the connection is between those things. <laughs> okay, and the, the big one here is that uh, anger is something that older people uh, suffer from more than younger people. Um, so a lot of what we're seeing here is uh, the uh, dissolutionment of people who are older, uh, which is correlated with the other things we're looking at. Um, finally, uh, people who uh, read the news every day get a lot angrier than those that ignore it. <laughs> so uh, my uh, advice for happiness <laughs> Don't pay attention to politics, don't pray, and stay young. <laughs> All right. So uh, what we have here is anger is widespread. It doesn't exactly follow the stereotypes that you read about. Uh, but one thing that we did notice earlier in the year was the very good predictor of what was happening in the presidential primaries was economic discontent. Um, so if you look over on the right there, um, you see that uh, people who said that they were worse off financially now than they were a year ago uh, voted for Trump about uh, 15 points more uh, than they voted for Ted Cruz and twice as much as they voted for John Kasich. Um, in fact, if 
uh, Republican primary voters had been doing better or the same, John Kasich would have been the Republican nominee, not Donald Trump. Okay, the, uh, it's interesting to compare this with what was happening on the Democratic side. So we see uh, as well that uh, Bernie Sanders was winning people who were worse off by a significant margin over Hillary Clinton, uh, winning slightly among those who said their financial situation hadn't changed. Um, and she won by a narrow margin those who were better off. The big difference between Democrats and Republicans at the moment is a lot more Democrats say they're better off than Republicans, which is a little counterintuitive. <laughs> Um, we've also um, so looked at people evaluating a five-year time span of saying, are they better off or worse off? Uh, and the people who say they're much worse off are a little angrier than those that say they're much better off. But there are a fair number of people who are much better off who are angry. What is it they're angry about? Uh, it can't be just the economy. So... Uh, if you look uh, towards people's evaluations of the future, what you see is that people who think they will be much worse off in five years are much angrier than those that think they'll be much better off. So what we have here is not so much objective economics driving these perceptions, but a fear that the sky is falling in. What in the world is causing this? Well... The primary explanation out there offered by Hillary Clinton recently was um, a basket of deplorables. That is, that there are people who are racist, homophobic, uh, anti-Muslim, uh, you name it. Um, so uh, racism is a thing that's fairly hard to measure in surveys. Uh, Old-fashioned racism, that is, thinking that blacks were uh, less intelligent than whites or that uh, blacks and whites shouldn't intermarry. Um, that sort of thing has largely, not completely, uh, disappeared. So the, the relatively small fraction of the electorate that are overtly racist in a sort of 1950s or in 1960s sense. Um, the standard way this is measured in political science is a thing called racial resentment, uh, which is trying to get at uh, what's been called symbolic racism. That is, people who... Uh, don't say things that are obviously prejudicial, but uh, they have resentments against uh, uh, blacks and other minorities. Uh, so uh, it's measured by four questions here. Uh, I'm going to show you all four. Uh, let's run through them quickly. Um, have blacks gotten less than they deserve? Uh, Irish, Italians, and uh, Jews, many other minorities overcame prejudice by working their way up. Blacks should do the same with no special <laughs> favors. Uh, it's really a matter of some people not trying hard enough. Blacks only tried harder. Uh, they could be just as well off as whites. And generations of slavery and discrimination have created conditions that make it difficult for blacks to work their way out of the lower class. If you look at all four of these measures, what you'll see is that the people who are, are in the most racially resentful category it varies depending on the question. We try to alternate the ends so that uh, we take into effect response effects. Those people are um, angry, and the people at the other end who are taking the most liberal positions are also relatively angry. Now, the explanation for that's fairly simple. Uh, there are blacks uh, and liberal Democrats who are on the, uh, the side of affirmative action and doing things uh, positively for blacks in response to discrimination. Uh, and then there are conservatives who tend to be on the other side um, and end up in the low end of this uh, racial resentment uh, scale. Uh, that makes it controversial to interpret it because are we just seeing the fact that uh, conservatives and Republicans are generally opposed to affirmative action? Uh, are we seeing some sort of covert racism? Um, be that as it may, I, um, that's a long dispute I don't want to get into. Um, the interesting thing here is that uh, Republicans, of course, score higher on racial resentment than Democrats, but Trump Republicans are no higher than other Republicans. Okay. Uh, similarly, at one point during the primary, someone published a piece saying the key to understanding the Trump vote is authoritarianism. 
and they pulled out some measures from the 1940s of authoritarianism. Uh, this is a famous story by Adorno uh, called the F scale, where you ask people, is it more important for uh, your child to be uh, inquisitive uh, or uh, courteous, uh, to be uh, well-behaved or think on their own? Um, and it turns out that Republicans score on the authoritarian end of those questions, and Democrats tend to be on the other end. Uh, as a parent, you know, you kind of say, well, inquisitive is good, well-behaved, that's also good. Courteous, you know, that's not too bad. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is uh, that Republicans end up on the authoritarian scale, into that scale, and Democrats on the other. The Trump voters, on the other hand, they looked like garden variety Republicans. Uh, so none of these things uh, seem to discriminate Trump voters from other Republicans. Uh, so I don't think that the, uh, uh, that the Clinton diagnosis of this, that half of Trump supporters are overt racist, that clearly is not true. The only way you get up to substantial numbers of Americans being racist is to use a set of questions like the racial resentment scale. Um, but it doesn't really seem to explain the Trump phenomenon. Okay. Um, well, another story is that it's a uh, political uh, failure. Uh, it's not economic discontent or racial resentment, um, but uh, the problem here is that people are frustrated with politics. Um, and uh, the answer here seems to be that yes, that uh, uh, if you think that politis politicians lie to get elected, you're quite a bit more angry than those that think this is relatively rare. Uh, most people think politicians do lie to get elected and don't uh, fulfill their promises. Um, okay. Another one is you think politicians are uh, corrupt or crooked. Um, and it, these are measures, uh, the crooked measure is one that's been asked forever, starting in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1950s, two-thirds to three-quarters of Americans would have rejected this claim. Uh, and today, it's reversed. About three-quarters will accept it. Uh, there's a left-wing version of this, that uh, corruption is uh, money and politics from uh, corporations. Uh, and there's a right-wing version, which is its political correctness uh, and uh, opposition. Uh, uh, I've lost my lead here. Um, so uh, both on the left and right, uh, people have said that uh, essentially the government is uh, captured by interests of various sources. They have different views of who the bogeyman is, um, but uh, if, if you read the New York Times carefully, you will certainly might get a, a hint of the idea that uh, American politics is in a crisis of um, honesty. Um, so let's turn to how uh, this sort of discontent uh, manifests itself in the present election. Um, the election in 2016 is going to be quite different from any recent election in that there is less ideological polarization between the candidates than there has been in the past. Um, so if you look at, back at 2012, most people classified Barack Obama as being very liberal. Um, the uh, plurality said Mitt Romney was conservative, uh, even though he said he was severely conservative, uh, and some thought he was moderate. Um, okay, if we jump forward to this year, what we see is fewer people think uh, Hillary Clinton is uh, as liberal as Barack Obama is. And in the case of Donald Trump, not a lot of people think he's very conservative, and a whole lot of people aren't quite sure what he is. <laughs> so um, it's an important point in that uh, Donald Trump has essentially managed to win the Republican nomination without um, making himself seem like he was uh, too conservative for the American electorate, which is, was definitely a problem for uh, both Romney and McCain, who were relatively moderate Republicans. So, um, 
in that sense, both of these candidates are, you'd think would be better situated uh, to appeal to the electorate. That is less distance between them, um, closer to the middle of the electorate, which is where the bulk of the voters sit, even in this age of polarization. Well, um, if you look at particular issues, though, you start to see a lot of polarization. So in particular, the issues that Trump has made the cornerstone of his campaign, uh, we now have a situation where uh, it's going to be very hard for a Republican uh, to uh, support immigration reform. The overwhelming fraction of uh, Trump voters are uh, for no sort of policy uh, to deal with the uh, a uh, large number of illegal immigrants currently in the U.S. Um, support for free trade. Free trade used, uh, agreements used to be one of the few places where uh, the parties could put together bipartisan majorities. Uh, that uh, free trade agreements from NAFTA on, well, actually for the entire post-war period, were uh, supported by a mixture of Democrats and Republicans. Um, now we have a situation where uh, Republicans overwhelmingly say that uh, uh, free trade is bad uh, for, uh, uh, for us. Uh, and a lot of the Democrats aren't sure about this, uh, though they're still among the Democratic electorate. There's uh, generally a view that it's good. The, um, Trade, I think, is overrated as an issue in this election. If you ask people what is the impact of free trade on them personally, what you find is most people, Democrats and Republicans, aren't sure how trade affects them individually. Um, in the case of uh, Democrats, more are likely to say they're helped by trade, um, even though uh, their support for trade is relatively weak these days. Um, so uh, trade itself, uh, while it aligns with immigration, doesn't seem to have the same saliency uh, that uh, immigration does. Um, it's a mistake to go through a long list of issues and try to figure out exactly where people are on each issue because the fact is that most people don't think, don't know a lot about the issues, haven't thought a lot about them. Uh, so they have sort of a general set of views. Um, and the best way to characterize this, uh, and this is an idea from my colleague at YouGov, Stephen Shakespeare, who in 2005, talking about uh, the UK, said somewhat presciently, there's sort of two views of the world. There's um, drawbridge up, and these are the people uh, who feel that we're under, under attack. Um, and in the case of Britons by uh, you know, immigrants, terrorists, uh, EU bureaucrats, whatever. Um, and on the other side are the people who say uh, it's a big, beautiful world, mostly full of good people, and we must find a way to embrace each other and not allow ourselves to become isolated. Um, and that essentially, if you think about it, was the Brexit campaign. Um, I rewrote this to sort of fit the American context. Um, again, this is one of these things where we push people to be on either extreme. Uh, most people are worried about terrorism, uh, and they think crime is bad. Um, the, uh, on the other hand, they don't really want to isolate themselves. But what you can see is when you push people, um, the Clinton supporters are in the open world, uh, embrace people. Uh, essentially, openness wins out over fear. Um, and this description of uh, threats by terrorists, criminals, and illegal immigrants basically sounds like Trump's acceptance speech. It's midnight in America. Okay. Uh, so that uh, does distinguish people, and I think that's kind of the range of things um, uh, we're likely to see. Um, all right, so about the two candidates. Um, so. Trump has found a message that seems to work in terms of expanding the Republican base a bit uh, to uh, lower income whites. Um, his weakness, obviously, is that about half, actually over half the population thinks he's not qualified to be president. Uh, whereas uh, Clinton's strength is that most people um, think she has a pretty good resume. Uh, so uh, a majority think that she's either very qualified or somewhat qualified. Um, you think that would be the end of the day. Um, if you look at a couple of other uh, measures, uh, are they honest? 
Well, neither of these candidates are viewed as being very honest, though uh, Trump actually does a little better than Clinton on that measure. Um, Obama famously said in 2008, uh, Hillary, you're likable enough. Uh, <laughs> well, this year, uh, her uh, likability appears to be slightly higher than Donald Trump's, but no one would envy these sort of candidate favorability uh, measures. So this is trying to say regardless of whether you agree for the person, do you like them as a person? Uh, and neither of these candidates does very well to, on that dimension. And then the killer um, is sincerity. Um, so the, the place where Trump is winning is that people think he's a truth teller. Uh, we measure this with an item that we've asked over and over again. Of, uh, do you think this candidate says what he believes or he says what he or she thinks uh, people want to hear? And Clinton is overwhelmingly in the um, you know, changes of views to say um, based on the audience she's talking to. And Trump, who really does change is that what he says based on the audience that he's talking to, is viewed as uh, saying what he believes. Um, I think it's a style thing more than uh, content. Uh, but he is absolutely uh, killing her on that. OK, so um, can Trump win? Uh, if you'd asked me a month ago, uh, I would have presciently said, no, it's impossible. Um, he has a strategy which basically writes off non-whites, women. He's taken every opportunity to offend women that he could. Um, and uh, a general style and approach that tends to turn off uh, highly educated white males, leaving him with white males without a college degree, the only group a month ago he was leading in. Okay. Mitt Romney won by substantial amounts, white women, white males with a college degree, and by a huge amount, white males without college degrees. There's just no way you can win this election uh, based on uh, winning only um, white males without a college degree. Um, so um, if you look at the most recent numbers, uh, what you've seen is that Trump has come up uh, in these categories. Um, and in particular, uh, even though there's a pretty substantial gender gap, we're looking, typically in American elections, we see a gender gap in the high single digits. Uh, I think it was nine points in 2012. Uh, this year we're seeing about 15 points. Um, but uh, the fact is that Trump is starting to get a, a more substantial fraction of the vote among white women. Um, he needs to win that group. Uh, and so that may be why uh, they've done some things in recent weeks to uh, try to appeal to that group. Um, we're, you probably came to find out what was going to happen. Uh, I'm not a soothsayer. Uh, but um, in, in my view, I still don't quite see how the arithmetic works for Trump. Uh, that is, uh, if you look at how he's doing relative to Romney, uh, he seems to be doing a bit worse in nearly all the groups except the white males with less than a college degree. Um, but um, in the thing that seems to be working for him is he does have a coherent narrative about what's wrong with American politics. Um, he's appealing to uh, politicians are corrupt and incompetent. Uh, Hillary's trying to say with some difficulty that she's not corrupt uh, and uh, that she is competent. Um, a much tougher sell to make than the negative ones. Um, he's saying that uh, the politicians you know are afraid to offend people, uh, illegal aliens, criminals, or whatever, uh, because they're afraid of being called racist. Uh, he's not afraid of offending anyone. He does it five times a day. Um, and then finally, what he tells um, uh, particularly the white working class, is you're getting a raw deal, uh, that the uh, immigrants from Mexico and Chinese are stealing your livelihood from you. Um, if you're angry and frustrated, uh, this may be uh, more attractive uh, than uh, playing it safe with Clinton. Um, the last thing I would say is that what we have here, it, uh, a large amount of discontent, but it's hard to trace um, to actual uh, objective uh, harm that people have. 
Uh, that is, the people who are most angry in this election are not the ones that are actually the worst off. Um, they're uh, one notch above that. Uh, so their grievances are largely symbolic. And we shouldn't be too surprised that people who have symbolic grievances reach for a symbolic solution, which is, you know, a reality TV host who shoots off his mouth uh, about things uh, in a way that um, is appealing uh, if you, uh, you know, don't like the status quo. Uh, and that's what Trump has tapped into. Uh, and I think that's why we're going to have a very close election, and I don't have the courage to tell you how it's going to come out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights, although you're withholding the final result, which I take you have in your pocket, but you'll show us. Um, uh, doctors have kindly agreed to take questions. So we... Ah. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say that there's a possibility. We have something like 30 minutes. And after these 30 minutes, and please, brief questions, we'll mix and mingle outside, we'll have drinks, nibblies, and you have all the time in the world to talk to him till... Midnight? No. <laughs> so don't worry about that. Uh, so please, three questions only, no statements. And um, yeah. would you like to take the questions, or do you want me to point out that lady over there? Why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> would you like to do that? Uh, whatsoever. Um, so Not that I refrain from them. <laughs> oh, okay, no, I'll leave it to the professionals. Um, so thanks mm -hmm. for, I don't think this actually turned out, but um, I have a loud voice. So thanks for your really interesting presentation. And the question that I have is, um, it's kind of about the second word of the title, angry. Um, the whole first part of uh, the polling that you presented is about um, people kind of assessing themselves as angry. And as a woman, I know that women are not supposed to self-diagnose themselves as angry. And I also believe that racial minorities in the United States tend to kind of be raised up thinking that they're not supposed to call themselves angry. So I wonder, um, first, if you think that affects that part of the polling. And second, given that then the Republican Party seems to be so strongly identified with anger, do you think that that has any kind of ripple effect between the kind of overwhelming white male nature of the Republican Party and the reluctance of women and minorities to identify themselves as angry. So, thank you. Yeah, so the first thing which surprised me, because I expected a big gender gap and people being angry, uh, and there wasn't. Um, and uh, it's, it's just not true that uh, blacks uh, are uh, not angry. Uh, that's something that's very clear in the data, that, uh, uh, that that's quite high. The fascinating thing happened in uh, 2008, right in the, at the bottom of the recession. Uh, the, there's a standard item we ask, is the country off on the wrong track? And it was headed into the cellar, uh, the lowest numbers ever recorded, except for one group, which were blacks, who said, we think countries headed in the right direction. Um, but what you've seen in the last few years is that blacks have come back down and uh, look about the same as other uh, people in that economic category. Um, in terms of the partisan appeal, um, I gave a version of this uh, about a week ago, and Tim garton Ash asked me, um, do, uh, do angry voters want angry politicians? And I go, not sure about that. Um, so we ask over the weekend, uh, would you like to have a president uh, that's angry? Uh, uh, or, you know, that gets angry about some things. I mean, I, I don't suppose people really want someone who's constantly angry. Um, and the answer was yes, you know, two thirds of the people did not want uh, someone that was angry. But what you did see on the Republican side is more people willing to say, yep, I want a candidate that's. Uh, that gets angry and voices um, my anger. Mr. Chairman, over there. I guess I can do without the mic. Uh, <laughs> I was struck by the curvilinear pattern of your anger uh, statistics. And first of all, I thought, well, that's strange. Then I thought maybe it makes perfect sense. They are similarly angry, but they are angry about very different things. For example, blacks getting less than they deserve. 
the pedicle was the typical curvilinear you had, the right. categories, the two extreme ones are the most angry ones. Right. And maybe the ones who don't agree that less that blacks uh, get less than they deserve uh, are the ones who are uh, angry about affirmative action and those who think they do get less uh, than they deserve are angry about discrimination. So right. maybe it fits the polarization uh, image that I have of the American uh, population now that they knit uh, their different narratives. They're all angry, but angry about opposite mm -hmm. things. Yeah, so my interpretation of that data would be the same as yours. Um, but um, my colleague at Stanford, Mo Fiorina, has written pretty extensively on polarization. Um, and uh, I've argued with him for years because it doesn't sound right. And his story is there is no more polarization in the American electorate now than there was a generation ago. Um, that the bulk of Americans are in the middle between the two parties. Uh, and what we've had is partisan sorting. So everybody who's a conservative is now a Republican. Everyone who's a liberal is now a Democrat. And the parties in, in office, uh, Congress, uh, the Democrats are too far to the left. The Republicans are too far to the right. And that's why people respond to everything, because you immediately know which side you're on. Uh, whereas in the 1960s, for example, there were very conservative Democrats or you know, um, overtly racist Democrats. Uh, there were lots of liberal Republicans, Rockefeller Republicans, and so forth. Uh, and th those are extinct species. And his story about uh, unhappiness or dissatisfaction among American voters is people in the middle uh, are don't like politics because it's a bunch of people on the far right and the far left that bicker with each other. Uh, and what they would like is is you know cooperation, compromise, and so forth, and these people on the extremes are uh, leading to uh, you know essentially a lack of that kind of solution. Uh, but we didn't see this in this data at all. Uh, it's the people on the extremes who actually are getting the parties to pretty much bend to their will. You know the Democrats almost nominated a socialist, um, and the Republican, no Republican on the moderate wing of the party uh, got very far. Uh, you know, Kasich was the furthest, and he didn't get very close. Um, so it's the extremes who are really getting what they want from the parties that seem most unhappy. Thomas. I have a good question. So I'm, I'm a white male. I'm an American. I live in New York. I am, sorry, I can use the microphone. I'm much more likely to be killed by my own furniture than by terrorism or being a victim of violent crime. So why is it, when you were talking about uh, our symbolic grievances, why is it that I should care so much more about terrorism or violent crime than, yeah. for example, being killed by my own furniture? I would be careful with the furniture you've got. Uh, <laughs> but um, people aren't very good uh, assessors of risk. Um, so, you know, when I get on an airplane and it takes off, I, my heartbeat goes up and I hold on, even though objectively I'm safer than when I'm driving to the airport. Um, the, um, so terrorism and crime and so forth, I think, are things uh, that people respond viscerally to. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it would probably be correct. It, you know, objectively for a policymaker to say that your risk of terrorism is very low uh, and that we've gone overboard on homeland security and airport security checks and, and the Patriot Act and all those things um, to address the fact that there was this one very visible event that killed a lot of Americans uh, that, you know, obviously no one likes. But there's no politicians that's going to make that argument. It's a complete loser. Um, so, you know, given the events in the last 24 hours, um, you know, it, it, not a lot of people were killed, but no politician is going to respond to this event by saying not a lot of people were killed. That would be considered insensitive and, um, and you know, so we're likely to get a pretty severe reaction. I think that's just human nature. A young man over there. There's a gentleman over there. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks so much for that talk. It was uh, 
really, really insightful and interesting. Um, Asher stats show I think anger is higher than it's probably been in a in a long time. Um, at the same time, it seems like Clinton has more or less locked up the African American vote, the Hispanic vote, the female vote, um, and you also see on the Trump side, especially I think, and you also saw this with a lot of of Sanders voters that if Clinton goes on to win the election, despite the, the outcome and how many people turn out to vote for him, um, most people will think that the system is rigged, or most of his supporters. So it looks like the way that the, the demographic is currently set up, uh, that we might be headed for even more division than we've seen under Obama, uh, regardless of who wins, that regardless of who wins, either side will, you know, really dig in their uh, heels. And what, what is your take on that? Uh, I think you're exactly right. Um, that whoever wins this election is probably going to be considered illegitimate. You know, Trump is you know, raised without any evidence that, you know, it's rigged. Uh, I think if Trump wins, the claims of vote suppression will come from the left. Um, you know, we don't seem to have a lot of confidence in, uh, in the electoral system at the moment, um, and it's going to be difficult for whoever wins. I don't, you know, it's hard for me to envision a situation where you get a grand compromise and unity after the election. Sorry to be such a downer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, so I'm wondering, you spoke a bit about uh, overt and hidden racism. Um, I'm wondering if anything in your data analysis speaks to overt or hidden misogyny when it comes to Hillary Clinton's candidacy. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, and I don't uh, I don't have any really good data on it. Uh, um, we've tried really hard to come up with some questions to measure that, but they're a lot harder uh, to ask about. If you take the uh, same questions that we use or variants on these, they don't translate at all well uh, into that. Um, the um, and you know. You, you, you have a candidate here who certainly has gone beyond the bounds of what was considered acceptable political discourse uh, by every candidate. I'm talking about, you know, Muslims. You know, so after 9/11, uh, George W. Bush was very careful to say, you know, this isn't uh, about Muslims; it's about terrorism. Um, you know, he said things about women that would be disqualifying, I would think. Um, so. Um, but we don't have any real good data to try to understand the roots of that, whether uh, it's uh, you know affecting his appeal. Um, one thing we talk a lot about how white working class men uh, have not had a pay raise in 20 years, basically the average uh, median wages of uh, white males have been constant over that period. Uh, what has not been constant over that period is, or at least over the period from 1970 to now, is uh, female labor force participation and female wages, white female wages, and certainly uh, black female wages. Um, so it, it's perfectly reasonable hypothesis if people are concerned about being crowded out by Mexican immigrants, uh, white males might feel that uh, they're being crowded out by women. Um, but um, so far, no politician has thought that was a good uh, attack to make since women are a majority of the electorate. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And one of the arguments that we frequently hear at the moment is that this anger phenomenon is a phenomenon that's pretty much, you know, all over the Western world, all over Europe um, and in other parts of the broader West, if you will. Now, my question to you is whether you can confirm this, whether you see similar levels of anger across the board, also outside the U.S., and whether you see a difference in the quality of the anger, stuff that people are angry about, or whether that's really this kind of pan-Western phenomenon that a lot of people claim it is. Yeah, so we've tried to measure anger across the countries that we're in. So YouGov is in the U.K., France, Germany, the Nordics. Um, and uh, it's, it's difficult because the questions don't translate uh, particularly well. Uh, so I, I'm not confident on being able to say if it's more or less in America than elsewhere. Uh, but I would say this election looks to me a lot like Brexit. Um, that, uh, you know, you had the establishment's experts all on one side, um, and there was an unexpected uh, support among voters for this. Um, and in particular, there was a difference between how people responded in online polls and polls with interviewers. Um, that is, they were less willing to express support to interviewers. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I have no idea whether that will pan out or not. Uh, but it, it has the same feel to it. Thank you, Douglas. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would care to speculate about the party structure in the United States and what will happen to it after this election. Speculate's the right word. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Let's, there are two cases. So case one is uh, Trump loses. Um, he's not going to lose by a tremendous amount, it doesn't appear, unless something happens over the next few weeks. Um, in which case, you know, Trumpism is not discredited. And uh, the Republican Party has a terrible problem uh, because essentially the base of the Republican Party is repudiated the congressional leadership, uh, McConnell and even Paul Ryan. Uh, who, you know, was very popular Republican a year ago. Um, and they have a difficult problem of uh, he's repudiated core beliefs of the party. Uh, he's walked away from essentially the free markets, free trade, um, the libertarian side of Republican politics, uh, leaving untouched the, uh, the social side. Uh, so I don't know what they do at that point. Um, so... Uh, that's bad enough. Uh, worst case is suppose Trump wins. Um, he's now the face of the Republican Party. He's a bit sui generis. Uh, it's unlikely he's going to be able to work very effectively with uh, Republicans in Congress that he's been openly disdainful <laughs> of. Um, you know, this just seems like a recipe for a party falling apart. Um, but everybody who predicts parties falling apart usually turns out to be wrong. Uh, so they'll probably muddle through. Uh, um, you know, so the closest thing in my lifetime is 1964, uh, which you know, was a complete disaster for the Republicans. Uh, they ran a true conservative, and he lost by the biggest landslide in history, that's Goldwater. Um, two years later, the Republicans made huge gains in Congress, and they won the presidency four years later. And essentially, at that point, had 20 years of dominance. So... Uh, I, I won't speculate any beyond that. <laughs> Thank you. Would three more questions be okay? I'm not going anyplace. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. One disclaimer, I am the chair of Libertarians Abroad. Uh, which is something that exists now for four weeks. We're a little bit late to the game, but I noticed that we didn't get any picture here at all of us. Yeah. Now, in, in some elections, this thing gets down to very, very small number of votes. It's the Electoral College that decide it's not the popular vote. And some people would argue that Ralph Nader lost the election for Gore because of Florida. So uh, the question is, would, is there any thing about the libertarian organization or the Green Party that, uh, that you discovered in your, in your polling. I noticed that among libertarians uh, that uh, there are certain groups, for example, active military service personnel support the libertarians by over 35 percent. So is there a chance that that could have some role in the election? And, and is there anything to say about the third party phenomenon in this? Uh... 
situation. So um, one thing that's different this year than uh, uh, every year since 2000 uh, is that there are larger numbers of people saying they're undecided and much larger numbers of people saying they're going to vote Libertarian or Green Party. Um, so that's the good news for you. <laughs> Uh, I hate to be one of these on the other hand, but on the other hand, um, what we know about third parties, particularly in close elections, is that their vote did, uh, goes down substantially as the election gets near. So, for example, Nader was polling close to 10% uh, a month out of the election in uh, 2000, and he ended up getting, I think it was around 4%. Um, so what we expect is third party vote to decline if it's a choice between Trump and Clinton in a close election. Um, the scenario that would have libertarians and greens getting more votes is if it weren't close, then it's a way of uh, casting a protest vote because neither of these candidates is very popular. Um, but right now our polling suggests it's relatively small. Um, and the bigger, I mean, we are only showing, there have been polls that have had uh, Johnson in, in the teens, um, which would get him uh, permanent, uh, would get him federal funding in the next cycle, but wouldn't get him in the debates. Um, we are showing him, and we use a sort of different method, more like around 6% at the moment. Uh, and then we're showing Jill Stein at about four, and I think that's about four times what she's actually going to get. Uh, but right now it's a way of the Sanders voters keeping from having to say they're going to vote for Clinton. There was somebody to the left, right there. Yeah. If you don't raise your hand, it's gone, right? <laughs> it's like an auction. <laughs> Following on the gentleman from New York about terrorism, um, in a completely anecdotal uh, survey of my cousins in the United States, I found a... <laughs> a scientific survey of your oh, cousins. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a disturbing disparity um, about their views on terrorism. It seems to me that the fear of terrorism, and after all, fear is the basis of anger, that the fear of terrorism is inversely proportional to the actual danger they're in. The folks in New York, the people in Washington who live at ground zero for 30 years, people in the big cities, they're ready. They don't get phased by it. It's the people in, in the suburbs of southern Illinois who are, who are barricading themselves behind seven security screens do you have you you did have anger but have you done any breakdown of who these people are by let's say ge geography or city versus country any of those kinds of breakdowns I haven't done that for terrorism um, it, uh, a guy at Gallup did a very interesting study earlier in the year though when he looked at uh, immigration and foreign trade and so they took all their data from the last year and they took uh, measures of to what extent the local industries had uh, lost jobs to competition from China uh, and also the number of immigrants or illegal immigrants in the area. And you know, the overwhelming you know, fear, opposition, and so forth, illegal immigration and Chinese trade uh, came in places that didn't have much of either. Um, and so I suspect that the same would be true of terrorism. Uh, but again, it's, you know, the thing you got to remember is you, it's what people feel about the threat. And what we're seeing is people who are objectively not, uh, you know, it, it's not a simple economic determinism. It's somehow that people have told a story about what's hurting them, and that's what uh, Trump has sort of packaged up into a fairly effective uh, campaign. I think we have time for one final, all-encompassing, fantastic, <laughs> <laughs> concluding, intelligent, entertaining question. Does anybody have this? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ah, oh, here we go. 
this is not funny, but I just was wondering if you could say something about the dynamics. So, uh, you know, why are suddenly all these people so angry? Does it have to do with, I mean, one thing you hear a lot is that the parties have not paid attention to these fears. For example, the Republican platform has been pro-trade and low taxes for so long. They're really not doing anything for people who do feel concerned. So how would you explain, you know, why is this emerging now? Does it have anything to do with the system of competition in the United States? Or what is it? Why is this bursting out at the moment? Yeah, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> so, you know, on the Republican side, uh, there have been signs of the um, discontent of the base with uh, immigration reform for quite a while. Um, and uh, that Republicans in Congress have pursued it, and there hasn't been any support from the base and some quite obvious uh, uh, disagreement with it. But it was you know, the Republican leadership in Congress was responsible for that. Um, the Democratic side is the one that, you know, I, I find really shocking, which is, um, you know, a year and a half ago, every leading Democrat was signed up uh, to support uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, Sanders couldn't even get a pollster to work for him uh, because uh, you don't want to be on that side of the Clintons. Um, and uh, he came this close uh, to beating her. Um, and that was just as much repudiation of the Democratic leadership as uh, the Trump thing was of the Republican leadership. Um, so um, I don't know why. Uh, when I'll figure it out, I'll be happy to let you know. <laughs> I think uh, that was a wonderful conclusion. I have to figure it out and let you know why. <laughs> Possibly before the election. That would be very helpful afterwards. Um, let me, at this point, thank you very much. You've um, given us a lot of uh, food for thought, a lot of things to talk about, to compare to European politics, UK, French, German, Berlin politics. And um, I now invite you all to step outside with a drink and an interesting partner in conversation to discuss uh, tonight's findings. And, um, Douglas Rivers, I can only say thank you very much for this inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.